So Judy, where did you grow up? And uh, please tell us about your family growing up. Well, I grew up in Arizona. I was, uh, I'm actually registered with the Apache Reservation in northeastern Arizona. But my grandfather left the reservation when he was a man, he said, which could have been about 12, 13, <laughs> and established an encampment at the base of the Bradshaw Mountains, which is out by an area called Lake Pleasant. And we had army tents. When I was born, we were living in surplus army tents that were kind of patched. And my grandfather would take, there were people who came from all over the world to see my grandfather. And he would take the archaeologists out into the desert for the different digs. And hence I wanted to be an archaeologist. Didn't get there. Um, and so that's where I started. And I didn't start school until I was almost eight. And I rode, we used to ride horses. We had to call our water in because Arizona there was no water. We weren't anywhere near the lake anyhow. And so we would ride horseback and leave our horses in a corral. And then my grandfather had an old panel truck. Back then they were called woodies. It meant a whole different thing. <laughs> they just meant they had wood panels all the way up and down the sides. And we would drive into a little town called Whitman, which if you blink it was gone, and get our water and haul it back out. And then my grandmother would hitch the horses to a cart and drag the water in those motors. Those big 55-gallon oil drums, does anybody remember seeing those? OK, so that's what they were. And we kept our water in that. And we sold shit. I've been an artist my whole life because uh, we sold shit on the roadside. We were the Indians with the blanket thrown out on the roadside. That was us. Okay, that was Okay, David, I need to direct the same questions for you. Where did you grow up? And please tell us about your family growing up. Okay, I grew up in Philadelphia, East Coast born. Long line of people from the Philadelphia area, basically uh, just outside in a little town called Penn Valley. Uh, then moved over to, well, the, actually, the early years, my father was in the Navy, so we moved around a lot to California, uh, yeah, Puerto Rico. Other place and then finally settled back in Philadelphia, a little bit of time in New Jersey, and I had pretty much a standard growing up middle class existence. Then off to college, North Carolina State, the United States Virgin Media Academy, so I don't have quite the adventures of growing up that you had. No electricity? Um, yeah. We had it. You were lucky. Flush <laughs> toilets? Mm -hmm. But we had to stove the colts. But I got three paintings on the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, Judy, when we spoke earlier, you told me that you were raised to be a clan leader. Please tell us about that. Well, in my nation, the women are the leaders of the family. And it makes sense because the women have the babies and take care of the homes. And you know, and, and, and even with us, it's, it, it's, it's that. But the women also make all of the decisions concerning the family. The women own all the possessions of the family. And that way, the family stays stable. Um, where was I? I do this all the time. I'm so sorry. Uh, Ron, you know. <laughs> we, we were asking how you were raised to be a clan leader. OK. And because the women are the clan leaders, in my family, it's the oldest woman, it's the oldest daughter of the oldest daughter. And in my family particularly, so the oldest daughter means the first daughter born in each generation. And there can be older members of the clan, older women in the clan, that are not clan leaders because they are not first daughters of the first daughter. In my family, my daughter was the first one break the tradition and have a son first before she had a daughter. But then she had a daughter, so it's still in, in my direct line, my great, 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 great grandmother's direct line. And so what you do is you make the decisions for the family. If, well, my grandmother, who was a clan leader, I was in law school. My grandmother got a ticket at like midnight. Indians like to do things at night, I think, uh, because we're all kind of night people. And uh, uh, I think it was because she had electricity. And so she would drive at night. But she would take off and do stuff at night. 
And I get a call at like 2 in the morning, and she's at the jailhouse in Glendale. And I have to come and take care of things, because she got a ticket. But she's telling me what happened, and it wasn't her fault. I said, Grandma, why didn't you call Judge Myers? He's a good friend. He would take care of everything. He was the biggest judge out there. He could have just put the phone call and leave her alone, basically. But no, she had to call me, because I'm in training to be Glendale. It's my job to handle this. Like if one of the boys get in trouble, and that was usually the boys that got in trouble, or um, uh, somebody in the family is sick, or someone passes, that it's my job to take care of the situation and make things work. So that's what plan leader means. Wow, okay. So David, what work were you doing in the 70s? Well, in the 70s I started out, first of all, graduating So 
you had to put on the mask and the robe, and everybody was sure it was me. I was the only one that couldn't hide. They all knew it was me. <laughs> my mother was 4'11", my grandmother was 5 feet, you know, and most of the aunties were right around 5 feet. So, and me at my 6 feet at 10 was enough. So, um, uh, it changed the way I kind of looked at things. Because watching the interaction between my aunties and my grandmother with nobody knowing who was making the suggestions, the decisions were made because they were good. And that's what she said. People will decide that the, the idea is a good idea or a bad idea because of the idea, not who presents the idea. So that was one of the things I learned. The other thing was, my, I had two aunties that were just a little older than me. They were in their teens, and I was, you know, they were supposed to take care of me. Um, but I, again, from my birth, I was taught to make decisions. And so, watching my grandmother deal with that sense of fairness, and my grandfather truly hated the white government. <clears throat> truly hated. And, and had reason to, because a good portion of his village and a good portion of my family on my grandmother's side don't exist anymore because the federal government offered $100 a head for um, adult Apache scouts and $50 a head for children for their scouts. Nobody knew whether it was Apache or not because her hair was all, the dark hair was all the same. So, uh, my, but my, we weren't Apache. We just weren't the ones they were supposed to be doing it to, according to the government. And so my whole family on that side is gone. My grandfather was one of the few people from that uh, encampment that survived. But my grandmother felt that wasn't a fair thing. You couldn't hold everyone responsible for that. And she taught me that I was going to need to go, I was going to have to live in this world I was going to have to deal with people of all nations and all colors. And so I had to learn to deal with people on their own merit. You know, it depends on the person. You know, it's just like when you're going to play. You can't say, okay, my, you know, this is my type, absolutely this. Well, I used to say that when I was young. I don't have a type. I realized that. It just depends on the person uh, and the feeling that you get when you're with them. So, you know, I learned that from her very quickly. Um, and she reinforced it throughout my life. So that's, and I've been fighting my whole life. Of course, you've heard a lot of it. <laughs> but I literally have been fighting all of my life. We'll, we'll get to some of that. Some of it's absolutely fascinating in a few minutes. But David, how did you become involved in the leather community? Well, I had a rare experience with to when I was living in Britain. But I really didn't find out about it until I moved back to Philadelphia. And at the time, I was living kind of a boring gay existence in suburbia with a lover. But we did go into Philadelphia, and there were a number of bars in the area, 247. But one of my favorites in those days was called the Cell Block. And I was always kind of adventurous. We ended up going in as just a private men's club. That was one way of getting around a lot of restrictions. If you go into this place up the stairs, at the bar on the left, and there was a big rail over the bar, generally set up so people could throw their clothes over it when they arrived. Of course, there were back rooms, and there was a wall of restraints and everything, which was all in a way. But I kind of figured that there was something with this when I walked in one night, and there, next to the bar, was a sling, literally parallel. A gentleman's in the sling, totally naked, except for a good pair of leather boots, of course. He's got a hand up his ass. He's got a martini in the other. All these little men stand around, and he's chatting away and never misspilling a drop. And I thought, I like his style. So that was my first taste until I came to San Francisco. <laughs> oh, I can <only> imagine. <laughs> Okay, back to Judy. Judy, you married very young. Why did you marry so young, and 
How many children do you have? <laughs> Ouch. I, I'm going to have to tell you that story. Okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, passionately, when you get married, you have babies because there aren't enough babies. We need, you know, if you get married, you have babies. That's the rule. Um, I came out in 1959. Actually, I was out. I, I, I was. I, I was out in 58, but I didn't have any girlfriends. And I was passing as a young male. And um, um, in Phoenix, I was living on the street with my best friend, Larry. And um, <laughs> anyhow, um, there was a, a, a gay man who felt sorry for us and wanted to get us off the streets and took us in. I knew I was a girl. Uh, actually, knew immediately I was a girl. But I was passing as a boy. Back then, I probably weighed 90 pounds and was six feet tall. And I was a stick. My grandfather said I could hide behind this wall. <laughs> but um, uh, anyhow, I took us in and intended that we would go to spot. Well, Larry was 20, uh, 23 or 24. I think it was 24. And I was 13. So I was going to school by then. I was almost 14 then, and he would make me go to school. Well, I decided I didn't like to go to school. I didn't want to do that. And I would never live at home because my stepfather was kind of violent, and so I would always take off. So the state team turned me incorrigible, and I was sent to live. <laughs> I'm still incorrigible, and I've been turned off that for more than once. I've been called that. I've been called worse. Uh, I could take incorrigible. And I was sent to a residential Catholic girls' school. <laughs> I was there for three years. Uh, they didn't like me very much because I was a lesbian and they thought I might contaminate their poor little girls. And I was stupid back then. I had no idea that most of the nuns were probably lesbian too. Um, I, was act I actually spent nine and a half months in solitary confinement. I was a legend in the school. Nobody ever saw me but the nuns brought my food. <laughs> Until they made the mistake of the cell next to mine, they put a woman named Laverne McAfee, big Papago girl, we tore down the steel door. <laughs> <laughs> then they put me in a basement cell where nobody ever went and uh, let Laverne out. Anyhow, so my mother found out and threw a fit and came to visit and they had to let me out. And anyhow, so I'm living and, and, and they picked me up again because I refused to go to school, and they put me out on the streets, the cops, basically. And um, I got my name, and then found out that I was an incorrigible juvenile, and they were going to send me back to the school. My best friend was also a young dykeling, and uh, older than me, right, 17, I think. And uh, nobody ever knew how old I was. I always said I was 19. And they would believe me if I, they didn't listen to me too much. Uh, and her, uh, she had a really good friend, and he was a nice looking man, young guy, in his 20s, and he just thought I was the hottest thing walking, and asked me to marry him, and I said yes. Well, to me, that was a commitment, and so I was married to him for 18 years. I have six children. Uh, my, uh, I have 15 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. And so, and actually just had a little, my, my great-granddaughter was born a month ago. Yes, yes. And, um, and I have a grandson who was born two months ago that I had to be at the birth and be with whenever he was born. So you have your own tribe. I do. <laughs> so look, they, they don't have to say this if you didn't do her child. <laughs> So David, uh, please tell us a little 
little bit about the leather scene in San Francisco in the 70s. Well, first of all, I arrived in 1977. As I stated, I came out to build a tree in Vallejo. Vallejo was just a short trip down to San Francisco. It just so happened that summer, both physically, weather-wise, and everything else, was probably one of the most magnificent summers they had seen, where you could actually wear t-shirts at night all summer long, which is very rare. So I arrive on the scene. First night I get there, I just figured I'd go in and check it out. A friend of mine told me about this place called Castro. I was visiting street friends I went to school with. So I thought I'd check it out. Mm. Not so good at night. So I thought I'd come back and try it one more time. Well, I came in, I was actually on Polk Street. Now, this is before, you know, Castro was really kicking in. Polk was there. I met a really nice man. So we ended up really hitting it off. We had a couple of drinks that we never did screw around the first afternoon. <laughs> but he said, listen, I've got to go to dinner with friends, and let me see if it's all right, would you like to go? And I said, yes, I would. So it ended up that we went to dinner over in North uh, Little Italy in the area of San Francisco. And it turned out the people that were there was a guy named Alan Ferguson, who eventually opened up the arena bar, his lover, Mel, uh, Bernard, who was Divine's uh, manager, and Mr. Marcus. Needless to say, that was the start of my trip to Leather Life in San Francisco. So we, I went running around with them all the time I could. And we ended up going to places like the Ambush, we went to uh, the Watering Hole, we went to the Thieves, we went to so many different places, it was unbelievable. And sort of a classic story there was we go in one night was sitting there in the ambush. I left there in Lobo, I'll tell you that sometime. <laughs> and I'm sort of a wide-eyed kid, still, you know, enamored with all of this. And Mark is sitting there talking to David. He says, oh, by the way, I've got to go to the bathroom. You know where it is? And he goes, it's over there. Maybe he's reasoning with their conversation. So, well, maybe I can go back there. Pull open this door. My eyes got about this big. <laughs> <laughs> I have never seen so many men in such a small place doing so many things, half of which I had never heard of. <laughs> I slowly closed the door, went back to Marcus and said, do you know what they're doing in there? And he says, oh, you got a piss, you go outside and go against the wall, and went back to his conversation. <laughs> so life took off from there, and it was like no old part. If you want to do it, fine. And I found the community extremely uh, embracing. It was, you know, I mean, there was no protocols. It was this, you were all embraced and you had a good time. Of course, it was let it be by in those days, but if you wanted to, you could learn anything you wanted to, and I was ready. So it was a wonderful, I, I consider it kind of the golden age. <laughs> it really was. Yeah. You, you mentioned something about a logo or a sign just a moment ago. The bar cards on the ambush was, beat me, fight me, fuck me. <laughs> Treat me like the pig that I am. I'm all over my chest, then get the fuck out. <laughs> just put your logo on your card. And that's where you can sign your trip card. I thought that was kind of cool. I think I have somewhere in a box there. But that was the days when they were opening. There were baths everywhere, as Mark told in his interview, that there was, there was so many motorcycle clubs with motorcycles. And uh, there were bars all over town. Everybody seemed to know everybody. There was, uh, I ran into people that ran the quarters. Um, I knew Robert Dunn. He was working with Drummer Magazine. So he was able to introduce me to so many different aspects. Uh, the quarters essentially were places you saw in Dover Magazine where all of the dungeon material was going on. We were fighting no on Proposition 6. We were doing Anita Bryant. We had um, Harvey Milk going on. We, we just had amazing things going on. It was like, can't stop the music. The village people was going on when they had the big finale. That was my birthday. Of course, you can't tell it was an all gay event because there were women around the edge of the perimeter. But it was great. It was Blind babies in full leather, pulling up in, in old cars and things like that well, with the village people. And uh, I got to hang around with Divine and Thelma Hughes and Deborah Washington. It was like one big party. There were bars for businessmen that were then going into leather at night. There were clubs. There was the, the boot camp bar. Oh, this is good days, I'll tell you. <laughs> so what else can I tell you about the set? 
<laughs> so I, I can't help it. And an idea that just popped into my mind is, what's your opinion of the movie Cruising? Do you think that's a thing? Was it accurate depiction? That's the Al Pacino? Yes. Well, I think it was, but that's sort of a dark thing. I don't think we felt the dark side. I mean, everybody said go to the dark side. Well, the dark side was, you ever done this? No, but I'd like to. And, you know, it could be fisting, it could be piercing, it could be whatever you want to, you know, yeah, we'll go do it, you know, a little scat, this, that, the other thing. No, I want to do that, that's fine, you know. But I don't think there was a sense of feeling it was more of an adventure, excitement, fun, sexuality, living for the moment, you know, it's just feeling alive. We felt alive as a human being. I actually got to the point towards the end of the 70s. I actually, from going and feeling sort of a sense of, you know, sort of the inferior human being as they were teaching us to as gay people were, by the end of the 70s, I felt superior to straight. I said, these people cannot be having as so much fun as we are. And probably weren't. <laughs> Sorry, it was good. So, Judy, <clears throat> please tell us how were you introduced to the gay community and the leather community? Oh, well, we're going to go back to 1959. <laughs> <laughs> and some people in this room weren't born then. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I told you, right? I mean, <laughs> um, the man that took us in, we didn't say leather back then, it wasn't leather. And of course in Phoenix, nobody wore leather. It, it, you know, Levi, there were a lot of motorcycle clubs, yeah, you had a leather jacket, but the, the, we didn't use leather to mean anything other than the jacket you were wearing when you were on your bike. Uh, but the man that took me in um, was what we would now consider a leather man. He was kinky. There was one bar in Phoenix, it was a cowboy bar during the week, but one night a week on the weekend, all the kinky guys would go there. Well, I was the kid, they used to take me to the bar, you know. Um, well, part of that was because in his home, I had my own space, but I always called him sir, always. And I, I, I like to tell people I never polished many size 13 boots and high heels in my life. <laughs> uh, so I can be a good boot black, but I just don't want to do it anymore. I haven't done it for years. Um, but um, uh, he did drag sometimes, but that wasn't unusual. But never his leather, never, never came to the drag at the same time. Ever, 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 ever. Never went in to the bar and drag, ever. But the drag was done as a way of community support. Back then. That, that was what they did. And, um, but he was, um, he was like my dad, you know, and, and he was really good to Larry, too. Larry was my best friend. He was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful young gay man. He was about, I can't remember if he was 23 or 24 when I met him. And um, Larry was a little bit retarded, and I wasn't, <laughs> and, but he was strong. And I wasn't, so, huh? Oh, he was very hot. And, and Larry was a prostitute. And he and I lived on the streets. Like I said, we lived, I was telling you the other day, we lived, and, and uh, we lived behind um, the dumpsters at the Westward Ho Hotel, which is a big hotel. It was a really fancy hotel. It was the fanciest one in Phoenix back then. And because they had the best food, so we could eat them in the dumpsters and have really good shit. I mean, we got prime rib a lot, <laughs> more than most people. But, <laughs> you know, but uh, and Larry was my protector. But I'm the one that kind of kept us out of trouble. Um, anyhow, so when we got taken in, he became um, a lover, one of, one of the lovers, to the man that I called Sir. And, um, his name was Stephen, and I'm not going to go into the last name because I don't know where he is now. But anyhow, um, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, again, Stephen tried to make me go to school. But that was my introduction. Knowing these men, they would play it at Stephen's house. Now I wasn't allowed in the play space, but I knew what was going on. I was not a stupid kid, and 
Um, I got to make things like bring the drinks and the chips and the, you know, I, I learned to cook there because I used to make a lot of the snacks and things. And I would always keep, you know, keep the house clean and go to school and uh, polish boots and go to school. Uh, but on the weekends, I would get to go to the bar. And the rule was, though, uh, that if the bar was rated, they had bar lights then. In Phoenix, it wasn't unusual for the bars to be rated. It actually wasn't unusual after I was an adult in the women's bars for the bar to get rated. Uh, but back then, we had a bar light. And if that light flashed, everybody knew. If you were doing something you weren't supposed to be doing, don't do it anymore. Stop right then. There was a back room, and, uh, and I knew about the glory hole. I think every, every good men's bar had one. And, uh, uh, but if that light flashed, my job, what I was supposed to do, there was, the bar was one of those where the top flips up, you know, and you could scoot on through. My job was to get under that bar, get out the back door. I'd go through the kitchen, out the back door, and hide in the oleanders. There were these huge oleander hedges. Uh, and I would have to hide in the oleanders till all the cops had left, and then if there was anybody who had been around, they would come and get me out and take me home. If nobody came and got me, I'd make my way home. But, you know, I was a kid. And that was my introduction to the leather lifestyle. I didn't reconnect with it and, and really get into it a lot myself. Well, actually, there were a couple of instances in the girls' school before they locked me in um, <laughs> where I had some fun in the girls' bathroom. But um, one of them was my, with a girl named Lassie Haas. I'll never forget her. Um, but uh, I didn't come back out into leather my secondary time until 1979, <laughs> where I was playing with the owner of our women's bookstore <clears throat> department and learning a lot of things. I'll bet. <laughs> well, David, I read in the book 25 years of champions about IML's first 25 years that you were very naive when you moved to San Francisco. <laughs> quoted as saying that. How was, was that the case? Um, well, you have to understand, a lot of cities kept gay life, <clears throat> excuse me, under wraps. And it wasn't really until the big cities like San Francisco where gay life was much more in the open. Um, and a lot of gay people Married, 
It was, you know, I was 15. Um, my ex-husband was an extremely abusive and controlling man. Uh, the physical stuff didn't come till much later, but the, the emotional abuse and the control was strong and there. And um, I was never allowed to really do anything. I was also very uneducated. You know, you just, I just been to the eighth grade. I'd never done anything. I painted pictures. And, and um, I would sell a painting once in a while, you know, because I grew up painting pictures. And I felt like, and my ex-husband was in an accident, so he was disabled, and we had to go on welfare. Well, it completely dehumanizes you. No one realizes how dehumanizing it can be. But when you're in that situation, and you're not educated, you have no way to get out of it. There's, you don't know anything else, so you can't see any way out. And I knew there had to be a way out. There had to be something I could do with my life. Something. You know, and I, I used to tell people, when I was doing my political stuff, I would um, tell them it was like being in a dark closet with no doors. You just felt like you would never get out of it. And I was, in a very bad way, uh, very close to stepping out in front of a bus. And I had five children by the time I was 22. So I was, you know, it was really not a good thing. I had options. I had gone to the welfare caseworker, because everybody had a caseworker, and told them I needed to do something with my life. And I had five options. I could work on a factory assembly line. I could learn to be a clerk typist. I could be a nurse's aide, a dental assistant. And there was one other that I can't remember, but it was all like very menial stuff that would have meant that eventually, and because back then there was no pay for anything, my, I would still have to be dealing with welfare and food stamps. Well, back then we didn't get food stamps, we got commodities. We got, well, as Indians, we got commodities, so I knew about that. Anyhow, um, I felt like there was no way out for me, so I was just done. I walked away that day. I walked to downtown Phoenix. I was standing on the corner of First Street in Washington and thinking about stepping out in front of the next bus. And um, I turned around, and the window behind me, it was the old Corex department store, and excuse me, because this, again, I said, this is really hard for me. Uh, but I said I will answer anything as truthfully as I can. Um, I turned around and behind me was this huge window. It was an old Quartz department store building. It was a five-story building. And the front said, earn a great living, be a commercial artist. I'd been an artist my whole life, and that was exactly what I wanted to do. Learn advertising. And I had no concept. I knew nothing. I thought, I would, we would drive by Phoenix College, and I thought, those people are the luckiest people in the world. They have to be rich to go there. Well, this I didn't realize. <laughs> I knew nothing about community colleges. And this was a community college in the same district, of the same system. But of course, I didn't know. And I decided I had nothing to lose. So I walked into the building. I said, I need to talk to somebody about being an artist and uh, doing commercial art. And the, the guy on duty, the security guard on duty, sent me up to the fifth floor, and I met this little redhead named Claire August. And I, when she found out I was a native artist, there was a huge native <coughs> show sponsored by the native club, Planapaha, at the community college. And so, man, she had me enrolled in classes, picked them for me, sent me to the learning center to take my college the, the entrance tests, had financial aids for me, and everything lined up before I walked out the door. I was blown. I had no idea. I was, I was stunned. And so I got home, and I told my husband at the time that I was going to college. I was going to college. I was going to start college in January. And he said, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're not going. And he told me that I couldn't go because if I did, it would mess up his welfare payment, and I couldn't go. 
and um, threw a fit, threatened to do some things. And I said, listen, this is the way it is. I either start college in January, or I walk out this door right now, and you are never going to see me again. So he, he, he it shut him up for a while. He left. He was so angry, he left. When he came back, he said, all right, here's the deal. He said, if you're going to go to college, and I'm going to stay home and take care of the kids, you're going to get straight A's. You get one D and you quit. I said, deal. Head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started school and I graduated from Arizona State University. I, I graduated from Maricopa Tech as valedictorian with my 4.0. I was also president of the student body, president of the tribal club. I was the district representative for the Maricopa County Community College District. I had won a major award from the Arizona uh, Corporation Commission and the Copper Mining Association of Arizona as the most up and coming uh, young person in the state of Arizona. So all of that within two and a half years. I started an ombudsman program. I, started an I started an ombudsman program between the community college district and the welfare department because I didn't want anybody else to be in my shoes. And it was so funny. I had no idea what was going to happen. I went on television, and I was talking about it, and I said, if you want to go to school, I don't care if it's this, or, you know, if you're poor, I don't care if you, you're on welfare, I don't care if you're just getting out of jail, I don't care. Come to the school these two days, this weekend, and we'll help you get enrolled. And there were um, four other women who had come from very poor backgrounds and gotten into the college system for various and sundry reasons who were working with me. Well, it ended up so slammed. We had over 500 people <laughs> walk through that little college's doors. They had to call in everybody. They had instructors from all the programs and admissions and financial aid and everything. And um, because of that, and because I had a new caseworker at the welfare department who was so proud of me, he was also a, a part-time cop, he would come to the college to do my interviews and things and ship things so that David wouldn't get pissed off and pitch a fit. Um, but he's the one that helped me set up the program so that if any caseworker in the welfare department had someone who wanted to go to school, all I had to do was call me. And I was president of the student body, so I had an office and a secretary. <laughs> <laughs> so they would call me, and I would get that, get them uh, in, and, and talk to them, and get them registered. So, and like I said, I graduated from ASU with a 4.0, and um, I had my bachelor's. Uh, I could have had three of them: one in uh, business, one in criminal justice, and one in uh, psychology. But I picked criminal justice because I went to law school. And that's kind of where that's what happened. The rest is history. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> David, tell us a little bit about the Brick Bar in San Francisco and the title that took you to INL. Well, the Brick was a great watering hole. Um, of course, a little change today, but in those days, if we didn't have the mass communication <coughs> You went after work to meet your friends. After work, weekends, Saturdays, Sundays. So you'd go in there and you'd meet, and we'd talk about whatever we wanted to talk. So you knew everybody, and it basically became, I guess the clearest example would be like Cheers, where you go in, everybody knows your name. And of course, this would happen a lot of bars, and since I had a lot of time on my hands coming off the rigs, and I'd be off for a month at a time, I'd get to know lots of people. But the rig, the rig was predominantly my bar. Um, there was other the arena came along a little later, but the brig, we essentially party. We had a good time. We uh, we go out, we do whatever. Uh, around 1979, of course, this is just before that, uh, Chuck Rainslow has sent out a circular to various different bars mentioning that he wanted to have a international leather contest in Chicago and asking people to send representatives. Well, the only bar in San Francisco that responded was the Brig Hank. He was a great supporter of the community. So 
course, it was very lucrative at the same time because you could bring people to the bar to run these contests. Now, he didn't have just one contest. He did it, uh, what I believe, and of course, we were talking about 30 years ago, it was about eight weeks. So every Wednesday night, so you have midweek crowds coming in, they would bring and ask for contestants. Okay, all of you would pile in, you'd be drinking beer, having a good time, and all against the wall as you came in on the right were a bunch of beer cases all stacked up there. So if you sort of stumble up on these beer cases, answer questions and do whatever we did. And at the end of that evening, uh, the audience would clap and carry on, and, and the person who would get the biggest response would go on and be slated for the very last week. Well, during one of those weeks is when I won my section. And uh, I was quite proud of it. I was a little shy. It was going to go. It was a lot of fun. And then the last week came along. And of course, it was already all the contestants from those eight weeks all get up there. They're on their pool tables in the middle of the bar. You're up there. The next thing you know is we're rounding applause. Hey, you win. <laughs> it's like, OK, now I'm going to go to the International Club in Chicago. What does that mean? Well, of course, nobody knew because what does it mean? You know, I mean, maybe they have a couple of bar titles or something like that. But it was an invention we decided to go with and hang with Jerry's supporter. He paid for your hotel, paid for your trip, and of course, you took your own leather. Boyfriend went along, and then you went a couple of friends and new people in Chicago. It was more of a family affair rather than a major event. You know, everybody knew people, knew people, knew people. And the first contest was. <laughs> it really does. It seemed very big when you're looking from a bunch of crates to a stage, you know, to look out over these people. But that's how the Briggs sent us off to Chicago. Incredible. So, Judy, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about your involvement in the women's community, in the women's movement. Oh, my God. <laughs> Well, like I said, I was kind of brought up to fight what I thought was injustice. Um, and I felt it started because I was pissed off. Uh, I found out that women were doing the same jobs and getting paid less. Um, that uh, lesbians were second-class citizens. That or third or fourth class at that point. Just so many things that, that were wrong. So I went to a couple of NOW meetings. And uh, I don't even know if NOW is still around, but back then it was. And the ERA was trying to be passed. And I read it, and, I, and I'm, I'm a law student, right? And I read the thing, and I know how the law works. It was pretty freaking straightforward. And yet, I was reading in the newspapers, of course, Phoenix is very conservative. Tucson's a little smarter, but Phoenix is, you know, 30, 40 years behind the rest of the world. <laughs> and so, it still is. I still hate Phoenix, and I live there. But um, uh, I would read this shit that they would make up, and I was like, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. What the hell is wrong with what it says here? And so, I started getting involved in it. Oh, my God. I was a delegate to the first ever conference, the Women International Women's Conference in Houston. Um, I was selected by the lesbians and by the black women primarily because they thought I was black and, uh, and the lesbians could spot me coming a mile off. And so, and I was head of the Women's Affairs Board at the Arizona State University at that time. So, um, I got, a, I got selected to go to Houston. Well, there had been a slight accident there. Uh, a little too much alcohol, because I had like not been with my husband for a long time. A little too much alcohol one night, shit like that, and I normally slept on the couch, all of a sudden I'm pregnant. <laughs> and I'm in law school. And now I'm a delegate to Houston. I ended up spending a lot of months in the hospital to have this child. I'm still glad I did. She's an amazing child. And went to Houston and went into labor on the conference floor. Well, I got a lot of press because of that. <laughs> they had to try to find a damn doctor um, and set up a medical center for me there. So it was funny that coming out of that, I 
named my daughter Equal Rights Amendment, Levi McCarthy. And it's capital E period, capital R period, capital A period, parentheses, Equal Rights Amendment, and then Levi McCarthy. <laughs> and my daughter ended up being the national ERA baby. I ended up being, and I had no idea what happened to me then. It was just, I was asked to speak um, at a conference in Washington, D.C. So I did. And then they had the National ERA March on Washington. I was asked to speak. Now, of course, you know, they never say how many people are there. Really, they never know. We said a million, they say, you know, 500,000, that kind of thing. I spoke in the Capitol steps there. I became so involved, but I became involved because of things that were happening to women who were poor, like me. Um, Houston, my I helped write the plank that was a presentation to part. Um, it was, it, it's, it's in a book titled What Women Want. And I helped write the, the plank, or the platform, for, uh, it's called Women, Welfare, and Poverty. And I also helped to write the one for uh, Women of Color. And it's, it, it was presented to the president in Washington, D.C. Um, in 1978. But um, my involvement in, in the Equal Rights Amendment was because it made sense to me. It was really very simple, and all the shit got added onto it. And then because of the way the women like me were treated, the dehumanizing. So that's why I had a call. Uh, like I said, I've been fighting my whole life. <laughs> if it's bullshit, I'm going to say it's bullshit and, and go after it. So it's how I got into leather. I, I mean, that's why I've got, you know. I've been involved in leather a long time. I love play. It's, I do it because it's fun. You think it's fun standing up in front of people you don't know and going, hey, you know what? I'm a, a leather guy. And this is why. <laughs> Our little group in Portland, <laughs> oh my God. Um, we, start, we started this place, this, this work. Actually, the first one was called Catharsis. The second one was Defenders of Mithra, but there were very few uh, king women. These were women who were fighters and fetishists, you know, just wearing the leather, they didn't play. And, um, and then and we started the Oregon State Leather Woman Contest. Do you know it was the highest leather title for women in the country? And at that point, one of the few, and that was started in 1982. Um, by 1985, we added Portland Leather Woman. But, um, and I got to judge that one, and I used to bitch. God damn it, what the hell is going on? They ain't got a damn, these aren't leather women. Poor damn, I'm not going to talk to you. Anyhow, okay, uh, yes. we can say too. Yes. Yes. Well, actually, Anyhow. Yeah, may I interrupt you just for a second while we change teams? Oh, sorry, you bet. That's okay. Thank you for indulging us. You mean I You were telling us about Oregon State and other. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. We, the, the, the organization we started in 1984 was called Portland Power and Trust. And Sasha used to love to say it's not an electric company and it's not a bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we thought it was a really good name. It just sounded so official. And, but PP&T is mostly what we said. And um, uh, Sasha and I were considered the leather mom. Sasha was my lover. Sasha was a little Jewish dyke. She was a pharmacist from Brooklyn, New York. She said she paid her dues. You know, Sasha was at Stonewall in 1964. She was at the women's bar across the street. She said she came out and people were throwing stuff and there was all kinds of screaming and yelling and cops everywhere and she had no idea how it was gonna change her life. The next night she was out helping throw stuff. <laughs> and so were a lot of other people. So I guess those riots went on for a bit. I think it went a few days. Oh, well, it, went, it went more than a few days. Yeah, it was like four or five days. But uh, Sasha used to love to tell the stories about it. But anyhow, so that was my partner. And uh, less than uh, two weeks after we became uh, partners, I moved from Phoenix to 
Sash and I met in, at Michigan in 1981, and I moved from Phoenix to Portland to be with Sash. And um, anyhow, uh, less than two weeks after we were together, we found out she had cancer. So we spent the next four years dealing with her cancer. I used to, I like to tell people, Sashi loved being Ensel, and she was Ensel as much as I was. But anyhow, uh, we started PPMT. Where was I, what was I doing with this? What was the question? I'm sorry, I really do. I'm on a medication that, I'm, I'm old, and it should happen when you get old. And I use that as an excuse a lot and get away with it. But I am on a medication that has, it wreaks havoc with my memory. And so I can remember old stuff, but if I'm talking, I lose, a, I lose a thread, and I can't, unless there's a key, I can't get it back. So I'm apologizing for this. Um, they know me in Dallas, remember? I gave the keynote at, in Dallas one year, and I would say, where was I? The whole audience would tell me. I was like, okay, and then I think it back. Uh, <laughs> um, what started that? Ask the audience, where were she? <laughs> It was, we were just talking about how you became involved with the women's movement. Oh, and the leather. The leather. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the yeah. difficulties you had because these weren't really leather women. Oh, that was, oh, I was always bitching. And we had two big leather dykes from Seattle, Lamar Van Dyke and J.C. Collins. No. And Lamar Van Dyke. Yeah, Lamar. Do you know Lamar? No, Van Dyke. Oh, that, because they were the Van Dykes. They drove around the country in their duck. And she's from Canada. In their place. And they were called the Van Dykes. And they ended up being stuck in Seattle. Anyhow, Lamar's been there forever and ran Tattoo U up in Seattle for a long time. But anyhow, these were the two leather mamas from Seattle. They were considered the leather mamas, the mothers of the Seattle leather community. And Sashi and I were considered the leather mothers of the Portland leather community because everything happened at our house, primarily because we could smoke there. We'd say, you want fresh air, go on the porch. Uh, but anyhow, I was pissed. I was judging this damn contest, and there wasn't a single kinky woman in it. These were all little standing model leather women, you know? And I was like, what the hell's going on? So Lamar looks at me, and she's like, why the hell are you running for it then? I can't run for none of this stuff. I don't do this. Well, then shut up, you know? Do it or shut up. Uh, anyhow, that, that, it, that got me politically interested. I was also a separatist. And it's funny that I became a separatist at that time because I came out with the men. They were the ones who protected me and took care of me. And I real, I had to think about that. Because when I was a separatist, I had to wonder, how did that happen to me? When did that happen? Why was I doing that? And I realized, it was because I was trying to find out who the hell I was and defining my roles as a lesbian. Because I'd never done that. And so I never like closed myself off like until I had to really look that close at myself and realize that's why I'm doing it. But the problem with being a separatist is when you decide you don't want to do it anymore, you don't know any of the guys. And so Sashi and I decided this is bullshit. We don't want to be separatists. So we started meeting some of the guys. Well, there's no leather guys in Portland. Not at that time. Yeah. They were, they, I would give our leather son, Andy Mangles, credit for really pulling the men's leather community in Portland together. Um, Andy's the one that created, literally created the men's community, so he would have men to play with. <laughs> and, and, and then they came out of Woodward because the joke was we only had the Knights of Martha. And, and that was the Knights of Malta, of course, and they absolutely were so adamant that there was no king in there. No king. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not in Portland. Boy, you're wrong. But now some of them were, but of course they were like, they do it, they hooked out the Knights. But that was another part of my act. That's another part of the reason I started fighting was because when we wanted to bring some of the guys down from Canada, teach our style of doing that, our club would not us. They didn't want men in there. It's like, they're the ones who know. Who the hell are we going to get out? I, you know, I told them today, it's a good thing I'm not in prison. I should be in prison. <laughs> Do you know how much shit we tried just because it looked like it might work? And it really didn't work that well? <laughs> so that, that's kind of how, what made 
going to start developing that data? Um, I'm sorry, I went too far. Uh, wow. Talk to you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> David, tell us a bit about the first IML. Okay, as I said, first of all, there were no expectations. There still really aren't major expectations about IML. You're supposed to essentially show up next year and judge, pass on the set. Same thing happened in 1979. Well, the, the big thing was, again, there was no, we had our issues. Of course, unfortunately, uh, we didn't have as pressing as like the but again, you were kind of sequestering in San Francisco. San Francisco had this kind of euphoric idea, you know, yes, we can type idea. Um, we fought an Eve Ryan, we won. We fought the Briggs Initiative, we didn't think we would, we won. You know, you have to understand this was a time when people were fighting yes or no whether it was all right to have discrimination on sexual orientation and everything. So we, we fought, but we partied. So we didn't feel this pressing need for survival, especially in the area of San Francisco. So as you come along and you come back to San Francisco, your friends internationally, of course a lot of people didn't have a lot of international friends, there's more New York, San Francisco, LA, and believe it or not, Houston were the big centers. Uh, you party, you went and you did things. Uh, our benefits were like meals on wheels. There was no AIDS at that time. There was no major problems such that you could grasp on other than small community events. And again, it was like I said, meals on wheels. So you come back, San Francisco, you go into the low bars of black and blue, the brig, the arena, and you end up bar guest bartending, and you do all you can to raise tips. The tip jar goes, goes to the local charity. And meanwhile, the idea is IML is like the senior party guy. You know, He's the guy that everybody likes. Everybody wants to have fun with, and that's what you did. And actually, it was told on stage one of those years, because this was back in the middle of when everything was politicized and everything. Somebody stood up for fisting in the aisles. Somebody went over to here and wanted to do this, and somebody did that and everything. And they were close, they were close. They wanted somebody to have a good time, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, you know, considering the fact that up until the early 80s, it really wasn't a major reason to do anything. Even when Patrick Toner went back, okay, his big thing to do in San Francisco was to build on what was Folsom Street Fair. Now, everybody thinks of Folsom Street Fair as a leather fair. It was not originally a, full, a leather fair, and it didn't start until the 80s. It was a community fair, which happened to have people from the leather community that partook in it. It was designed to stop developers selling the market. And so Patrick decided to start a small little let's have a street fair. And it was on Greenbold Alley, and it was called Greenbold Alley. And it kind of had to move to Dory Alley when the neighbors kind of got pissed with <laughs> having fun at night versus in the middle of the day. But that was about as far as we went other than being involved in local issues. So I know it was a good time. <laughs> So Judy, what's the difference between a lesbian and a dyke? <laughs> People always ask me if I'm a lesbian, and I say, no, I'm not a lesbian, I'm a dyke. And they ask me to define it. I'm like you just did. I say, lesbians make love, dykes fuck, and we talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> David, you're now a Canadian citizen. Yes. Yes. Okay. What are your thoughts on gay marriage in the United States? Well, I'm kind of a bit of a maverick. As you know, I left the United States because of the situation. So I, um, my history up until that period of time when I finished with the oil business, even in this Houston, I was doing some fundraising. And then I went on HIV AIDS. I lost a lot of friends and everything, a lot of lovers. And then I went into charity work. So I felt like I was family, I worked hard, I supported the community, I had done my dues, and then I moved to San Francisco to say, okay, I'm going to still continue doing this. I'm board of directors of this, board of directors of that. Raise money, raise money, raise money. Be involved politically. Um, I went to Toronto. I had never hit IML in 2001. My partner, Whitney Collette, and we finally tied the knot as far as at least I can be together in August. So it was one of those things 
things. Well, I had a house in San Francisco, and he was much more flexible. So he officially came to stay with me, but not officially because you couldn't do those things. They didn't want a lot of foreigners coming in. And so we had sort of like a nice little touchy way of illegal situation going that wasn't, you know, was always on the edge because you never knew what the door was going to slam. So we were doing our part, going back and forth across the border. And then one time he ran into a border guard. The border guard said, why are you in the United States? But we made a big mistake. We had bought a ticket round trip and we forgot we couldn't find the other half. So we thought, well, we're sort of stupid. It's cheaper to buy a round trip ticket from San Francisco out of this, except for the lab himself. And they basically interrogated him for four hours. And they said, we don't want your kind in here. So but I was my boyfriend said, I don't care. We don't want you living off an American. Well, they finally let him come in for a little bit. Uh, this kind of threw us in a quandary. I'm living in San Francisco. I'm HIV positive. All my health care is down here. The most things you have down here are kind of protection is basically in a very small area like in New York. Or in a lot of communities, you don't have any protection. You know, you lose everything from the nearest relative. So all of a sudden, I found my life in total upheaval. Here, I've been doing my best, and all of a sudden, my country basically tells me, we don't care what you you have a choice. You can stay, and give up the person you love, or you can get the fuck out. I did not take that very well. So needless to say, my whole idea with regards to the marriage bit in the United States, equal, not equal, I really started to study it because a lot of gay people in America really don't, I mean, we talk about it, but when you're kind of in your own little sheltered community, you don't feel very comfortable because it, until you're pressed against the wall, you tend not to respond. Again, until you get angry. Mm -hmm. Well, I got angry. Mm -hmm. I got fucking angry. I yelled and screamed. I talked to every magazine I could. I sat down there. I talked. We did an entry, and I was one of five people that went to Canada. We did a documentary called Gloriously Free. Five people came from five different countries around the world because they could not freedoms in their own country. And of course, when I went up there, I said, well, I'll do it, because I was going through land immigrant status, so there's no way to stay up there. So they were saying, well, you know, you're American, you, you're all free, you can do whatever you want. I said, yeah, tell that to me. So we did this thing, and meanwhile, we were in Reason Magazine, we were in Time, we were uh, Amnesty International, we talked, we carried on. This documentary was translated into seven languages, and then all of a sudden, 2003, Ontario says, you can legally get married. And I was like, whoa. So we went down to City Hall, and there we are, and we're going for a marriage certificate. You can imagine, here I am, a man who has gone through most of my life trying to pretend I'm not gay. Not pretend, but at least hide it so that my life is not in jeopardy, my home's not in jeopardy, my job's not in jeopardy. And I can go down to City Hall and apply for a marriage license. Legally. And it was like, wow. And at first we thought we'd hold off a little bit. And there was a little bit of confusion. And I remember standing there, and this guy at the New York Times says, Well, why do you want to get married? You know, half the people in Quebec were, you know, in domestic partnership relationships. And, said, and my partner said, Well, you know, we want to do it because, you know, we can. We want to show the world we can. So we get all dressed up, we go down to City Hall. None of those fancy plans or anything. I went down with him and him. Two witnesses, just for peace. <laughs> of course, he's a youngster. He's in his 30s. He's Canadian. And it's not quite so much a big deal. I cry. I start to cry. I mean, I'm 50 some years old, and I'm standing beside somebody that I really love. And I can officially hold his hand and say, I do. Legally. And it was the most amazing experience of my life. And every time I hear the stuff, and of course we have different news than you do, of course you know what's going on down there, but we just BBC and CBA, CBC and everything. Yes. But when you said before the stuff that's written versus the stuff that they spout on television, it makes you so angry. It's the idea we 
are people, we contribute, we give of ourselves, why won't you give us the rights to be like everybody else? And so my ideas on gay marriage is, you don't have to do it if you don't want to, but you should have the right to do it. Amen. Okay, a few questions to direct to you both. Some people have made the observation that modern title holding has involved has evolved rather into a monster of sorts. There are so many of them. So is a successful title holder a strong person with a title, or is it a person who inhabits a title to meet its expectations? You first or me first. I have some ideas on that. Too. Go for it. Okay. You can there, there were times, so, uh, as I said, I got involved. I've been going on HIV where I work and devote a lot of time, and I went to work for various AIDS organizations on the board of directors. And I worked as uh, people in the office and doing all kinds of things, but they're really small. And I used to get a lot of flack because they'd say, well, you 
you don't say you're David Close high in that 1979. I said, well, no, I'm just doing something because I believe it's important to help people. I think, you know, you've got to give back. It's kind of like, it sounds silly, but this karma thing. If you don't do good, you're not going to get good back. So therefore, I figured, and I used to turn to him, I say, you know, the title does not define me. The title is defined by what I do. And that was basically the way I thought of life. You know, if I'm sitting down there, I don't have to be the president of something. As long as what I do reflects well on the title, that's what's important. You're not a strong title holder. You're a strong person who has a title. Incredible. Now see, for me, you, you were doing the same thing, but you didn't realize it in 79. I realized that what I was doing was creating something. Now, somebody created the title, you know, the group of people in San Francisco created the title. There's an internationalist letter, okay? Um, but I, I used to tell people, you know, here's the good news I have. That it was good news for me. I didn't have to follow anyone I could create. It. And here's the bad news. I didn't have anyone to follow. So, and it was true. But I had an opportunity that, that and, and you do too, that most people don't get. Um, I knew that what I did could be important. I also had some reasons. I ran, primarily I ran, because, I, like I said, I got my own words thrown in my face. Um, like, if you don't vote, don't bitch. So Sashi used that on me. Okay, don't bitch about there not being any leather women running for this title unless you do it. And I knew there was a whole lot of shit coming down because Seattle, Portland, and San Francisco, the women's communities, were pretty tight. We all knew each other. Um, there was running up and down I-5. Sasha used to say, I've gone up and down I-5 so many times I feel like a Benoit ball. But, um, uh, so San Francisco, uh, the, uh, <sighs> the outcasts? Why, why can't I read it? The outcasts. Um, the outcasts were supporting Hensel. And then pulled out. Now, I'm not sure. I heard stuff. But you know, you always hear rumors. And I've decided many years ago not to believe them because I've heard a lot of rumors about me. I'm a hermit living on an island somewhere in the San Juans, whatever. Uh, I am kind of a hermit living in a garage painting pictures right now. It's a little more arid. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I think you're in all this. Oh, I'm dead. I've been, been dead a few times. Um, but uh, I've heard the rumors, and 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 I'm not sure what was, but I know there was a, a division, and the outcasts pulled out. Well, a lot of the members of the outcasts were really close with some of my friends who were in the, the, the group in Seattle. Why did I just, just lost the name? I'm sorry, I do this all the time, and I apologize. But anyhow, the group in Seattle that we were all, you know, because we have UP and in Portland. And so then the Seattle crowd pulled out. And Kathy Gage and Sky Renfro, who were on the board for Emsel, called to talk to Sasha. They called our house because everybody who wanted to know anything about leather going on in Portland called our house. Um, what's his name? Geraldo Rivera, his wife, Cece, used to call him our, our house all the time to, want to, to ask his questions. No, they were too? No, he would be having some kind of a guest on some, with some strange issues. One was a lesbian judge, juvenile court judge with a, with a child. And we had one. Wow. So she always called us on strange things. Wow. So Kathy Gage called our house and asked if the Portland Leather community would come in behind Emsel and support it. And so she said, ask her a bunch of questions about it and why they were starting it and who was involved. And, and so by the end of the conversation, Sasha said, yes, the Portland community will support you. Um, and we talked to all of our crowd and they said yes. Um, Sashi then called Kate from the primary domain, which was one of the two primary women's bars in, in Portland, and asked her if she would sponsor the contest, and Kate said yes, and she would also give the winner $500 to compete. So, so we had to create a contest very specifically 
as a feeder for Enzel, because Oregon State um, leather woman was not. And so there were 14 of us who ran, and I wasn't going to run. I mean, I, was, I built the stages, you know, I did all that. I was willing to do all the work, but Sashi and Sally Huber decided I wasn't going to, I was not going to know anything about what's going on with this contest. I was like, I'm going to run. And so then they both kind of tackled me about it and made me feel Catholic guilt works. Um, so, and I keep saying I'm a recovering Catholic. I was in a Catholic girls' school, what else? But, uh, so I agreed to run. And, and Sashi made me see that what I was doing was supporting another step for leather women. And so that I could do. And so we planned to go down, we would do our support, um, let them know that Portland was behind them, and then we were going on vacation because Sashi's cancer was in remission. And we had planned a vacation. We were going to go to Vegas and then down to Arizona to see my kids. And then I was going to take her into Mexico. She, she'd never been to Mexico. So we had all these big plans. And um, my famous last words when I left Portland, because everybody's like, gee, you're going to win this. You're going to win this. Like, you're not going to pick up that 40-year-old Indian dyke to be in a national sweater. Get real. You know, it's like, don't do it. It's not happening. And it was so funny because they did. Um, but, and so, of course, I had picked my winners. I knew who was going to win that contest. I had a pick. Shadow Morton was going to win. And Sky, uh, 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 Rainbow and Kim Wallace. And I didn't know who was going to come in, and I didn't know whether there was going to be first or second runner-up, but I knew that's so, what, but Shadow Morton was going to win. And so I had a pick, and Shadow was right behind me. I kept hitting my feathers, caught her studs. Because <laughs> yes. I had a full dress, chief's, a full chief's headdress, and, uh, and she had these huge spikes everywhere. Back then, Shadow was a sheep. Um, Shadow was a young man now, and has been for many years, but... Um, and also still one of the nicest people I've ever known. Just a good human being. But anyhow, Shadow and I became buds. Shadow and I and Rainbow, we really enjoyed fixing her strings, you know, because Rainbow's a dancer with the nicest ass I ever saw. <laughs> anyhow, um, so I knew my winners. And so we went through all the things and everything, and, and when it's about over, um, I'm standing, and we were in the Club UD8 in San Francisco, which is a very small stage. The stage is no bigger than, if you cut that one off at that angle, and that one off at the angle, and bring it to about here, that's as big as the stage is. And then it's got a long fashion runway. Um, and there were um, 14 of us, and I was number seven. And we were in this little U shape like this, cramped. And I remember stepping back and looking around, and I knew who was going to win, right? And so they announced the first runner-up. And it was, um, no, they, yeah, they announced the first runner-up, and it was Rainbow. And I thought, well, okay. Um, no, the second runner-up was Rainbow. And I thought, okay, so Rainbow got it, and Kim Wallace did it. And so, uh, Kim Wallace will probably be first runner-up. Well, they called Shadow Morton as first runner-up, and I thought, well, who the fuck won then? <laughs> so I kind of stepped back as far as I could, and I'm not even looking at anybody. I'm looking up and down the line trying to figure out who the hell won it. And so they announced me, and I didn't hear. And so there was a young woman named PJ. She was from Minneapolis, and she was right next to me on this side. Shadow was gone, so PJ's next to me, and I leaned over to PJ, and I said, who did they say? Did they call? Who did they say? She said, you, get out there. And I went, me, me. And so that was it. <laughs> but I was like stunned. And uh, needless to say, our vacation got postponed. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to create something. And uh, Chuck friends a little scary the shit out of me. No, no, I'll never let it. Well, what advice have each of you for present and future title holders? Mm. Well, first of all, I think that you really want, need to do it for the right reasons. Yeah. Um, and you have to make sure you know the reasons you're doing it. And 
I think the idea of bringing greater unity to the leather community, uh, you know, leather brotherhood and all that kind of thing, I think those ideas are fine, but you have to have a core reason. How are you going to do it? Not what you want to do, but how you are going to do it. And before you get on the stage, you better be ready to know because I want you all to be together, world peace, love you, and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't go very far. So you got to be really ready to know what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Yeah, that, that, that's excellent advice. And mine, mine usually to brand new title. I've had a lot of brand new title holders come up, and, and so, especially a lot of insoles over the years, and say, what advice do you have for me now that I've won? I said, eat before you go. <laughs> <laughs> because, and I'll, I, I want to tell the story on that one. I, MAL, right? I get invited to MAL. And I get there, and there, Frank Nowicki, I helped, Frank was just a pop back then, and he tells this story too. And where I decide, I get in there, and I want to help get ready, get the banquet. They, they had this wonderful buffet, MAL. And uh, uh, I wanted help, and so Frank said, well, you can help me, we can peel eggs. So we're back there talking, and, and we're peeling eggs, and Frank is doing the flowers, because he was in charge of doing all the flowers. And when I got out there, and I saw that buffet table, and I hadn't eaten all day, because I flew in, they took me to the where the contest was going to be, and that was it. So I'm working around all this food. I walk out there, there is roast suckling pig, <laughs> a shrimp tree of ice with shrimp everywhere, all these wonderful foods this laid out. This is we didn't eat dinner. <laughs> um, that's okay, I'll, the rest of the story is I got two shrimp. <laughs> I'm serious, because you're so busy meeting people and talking to people that food is like peripheral. It is. So that's what I for you about. But I agree, David, I think prim the, the, the primary reason to run for a title is if you really got something you want to say, or something you want to see have happen. Now, one of because we both judged lots of contests now, lots and hundreds, hundreds. And um, uh, one of the things that turns me off immediately is someone who says, "My, uh, I want to see more. Uh, I want to, I want to join the men's and women's community together." And that turns me off immediately. That the transgender. Yeah, I know. But, but usually that's what they'll say. I want to join the men's and women's community together. They leave out a whole lot of people. If you do that, it's called right Two. Two. <laughs> Two, they, um, they, they also don't know any of their history. So they don't know what it was like when they're really gross, no community unity. So they have no idea. And uh, so that's a that's a turn off like immediately. And boys, I always ask them who started the boys movement, and most of the time they don't know. The first boy to stand up and say, "I'm a boy and I have a voice," was John Syracuse. So it's it's like giving generalizations, you know, because they don't know what the hell. It just sounded like a good idea at the time. World peace. <laughs> yes. And and. I remember what I, when they in my my speech my I wanted to be honest. I'm running because I believe we need to be visible, and so that's why I ran. We needed to be visible. And Chuck Rinslow, can I tell that story? We've got a couple of minutes. Sure. Okay, I, I love to tell stories. You guys that mm -hmm. know that I always tell them. Chuck Rinslow scared the holy living shit out of me. My first major thing to do was Rinslow was to speak at IML. And I've never let Chuck, RJ, you and, you and Gary were in charge of IML back then. Anyhow, um, Chuck had said, well, you know, you're the first woman we've ever invited on stage who is not a performer or an entertainer. So he said, I have no idea what reception you're going to get. He said, I've had an awful lot of talk from the men who do not want women at IML. 
So here I am walking in there trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to talk about, not get booed out of the building. And so all that fear, and I actually wrote, I had no idea, I've never, I've never in my life known what I was going to talk about in a, in a, when I'm speaking until I actually get there and, and something, Something happens that triggers something that's important, and I can talk about it. It's, it's just really strange. My friend Jim Richards used to call it the speech fairy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I had no idea what I was going to say, and I was sitting there with an empty pizza box, and I wrote what I was going to talk on the empty pizza box. And I thought, well, I may get booed out of here, but at least I'm being honest with them. And so I talked about separatism. But you know, it was so funny because Judy Tenuta was the um, entertainment the year, that year. And before Judy was even introduced, they knew what was coming because the program, the whole crowd, all the guys in the crowd started going, Judy, 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 you know, and she comes on stage and does her bit. And I knew I was going to be okay when. Chuck got up to enter, or I can't, or was it Frank? I think it was Frank. No, it wasn't Frank. Frank was a puppy. Uh, I can't even remember who was the MC that year. I think Al Parker. Yes, you're right, it was Al. Al it was Al, you're right. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was Al. And when, just, as, just before he starts, to, just as he started to introduce me, this huge auditorium starts yelling, Judy, 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 and I knew I was going to be okay. <laughs> and I always say that it was the men's community that helped make insulin. Because there weren't any women, I mean, there were so few women anywhere. And that opportunity to speak at IML, the guys were embracing and invited me all over the country. I, I pretty much, you know, Sasha and I didn't say no unless she was on a chemo, and I spent my time taking care of her on chemos. But other than that, we were on the road that whole year. We spent like $10,000 our first five months out of pocket. There were no travel ones. So it was a pretty wild time. I think, I think that was one of the best decisions we ever made for having you come up that, that year. Thank you, RJ. That's a cool thing to say. I just remember being so scared. I remember having to go pee before I got on stage. <laughs> I had to go pee, and the bathrooms had lines two and a half miles long. There were guys everywhere. And you, it was you who sent someone to take me to the bathroom to make sure I got back out there and on stage. I'm sure it was you, because you were standing right down there on the front. And I said, I gotta go pee. And then you like grabbed somebody and said, get her to the bathroom, get her back here on stage. Ladies first. Yeah, and so I'm walking in this line. I'm in my black, I wore a black leather gown that year. And I'm in this line, and I'm passing all these guys waiting for the toilet. And I'm heading in. And uh, the guy walked in, and he said, woman coming through. Info coming through. And um, I got into the, it's just like, uh, everybody said, okay, fine, no problem. <laughs> I didn't care. I, only, I met one guy many years later, and we're friends now, he said, you know, he walked in there and I dried up right now. <laughs> but IML, it was the men's community that helped us build the women's community. And, you know, it was reciprocal at that point because it was, it was we were also, all of us, doing everything we could to try to keep our brothers alive. I'd like to conclude the formal part of our interview with greetings from the current Insel and the current IML to their, to their seniors in the community. So this greeting is from Lamalani to Judy. Judy, thank you for all you've given me and, for, and to the community. You're a great friend and role model. You were in my life when I first discovered this community, when I received my first sash as Washington State in his leather, and I hope you'll continue to be in my life for many more milestones. I love you, Lamalani. Aww. That's great. <laughs> and from the current IML, Jeffrey Payne to David. He's a little more ebullient than what he's saying here. Um, David, 30 years ago, 
you accepted the first title as I know, and with it the responsibility of serving as the Grand Ambassador to a community that was ever-changing, coming out of the shadows and into the mainstream, and needing a firm hand of guidance to ensure its longevity. A task that, to most people, would seem more daunting and glamorous, and more intimidating than relaxing. Yet, with your incredible smile and your honorable heart, you accepted the responsibility and you have served our community every day since that moment. Thirty years later, men and women like myself are living their leather fetish and lives openly with pride, knowing and appreciating that you were the first at the helm steering us on our journeys. None of us can thank you enough for the service you have provided the community, and for me, it's an honor and a privilege to share the title with you. Your leather brother, Jeffrey Payne, I am all 31.